My dudes, before we begin this episode of Potterless, just a few quick announcements. First, it is the first episode in October, meaning it's donation time. Here at Potterless, each month we pick a new charity and donate $1 for each patron at our team over at patreon.com slash Potterless. And at the time of recording, we have 527 patrons, meaning we are donating $527 to the Foundation for the Carolinas. A lot of people suggested that I donate to a charity that helps with Hurricane Florence relief. And the Foundation for the Carolinas is one of the highest rated charities ever, and it's been doing great civic engagement work for the past 60 years, but they set up a specific relief fund for Hurricane Florence where they are taking donations and then picking the best relief charities in North and South Carolina to help out with relief. So I think it's just a great place to give money to because they have the best understanding of where the money could go to help the most amount of people. So if you want more information about them, you can go to fftc.org slash Hurricane Florence to see all of the work that they're doing there. Second, I mentioned this last episode, but now I have more information. I'm going to be at Vancouver Podfest on Saturday, November 10th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. doing a Harry Potter Podfest featuring Hannah McGregor from Which Please, the entire team from Flipendo, and Samantha Knock. It's going to be super fun. And what's great is this event is free. There are a ton of other great things going on at Vancouver Podfest, and some of those require tickets. But the event that I'm at is free, so you don't have to pay anything, which is great. If you want more information about that particular event, you can go to bit.ly slash potterlessvan, all lower case. And if you want information about the entire festival, you can go to vanpodfest.ca. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon and Calm. I'll be talking more about those in the middle of the episode, but speaking of support, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Sienna Guarazzi, Sharna Lim, Saraj Subravetti, Jess and Sam Olson, Will Fleary, Elizabeth Baker, Caitlin, Alex Ellis, Charlene Yin, Kalula Dixon, Emily Gogol, Miko Sapola, Ashley Shoecraft, Kristen LaGrange, I Will Be Adorable, Tracy Quinn, Laura Reynosa, Tyler Jara, Caleb Oman, Lily, Helen Warner, Eric Chu, Kelsey Spence, Betty Sun, Kelsey Richter, Aaron Rapp, Deidre Nauth, Tia Williams, Hannah Turner, Caitlin Ridley, Barbara Presley, Ella, Sharon Baylor, Jimmy Block, Timo Eller, Sarah Moody, Sophie Riger, Paul Uppity Gender, Keely Southern, Max Biggood, Cara Hoyer, and someone that made their name Severus Snape. And shout out to Missy Curtis and Georgia Bishop who upgraded their pledge. And a huge shout out to Taylor Fulton, Ash Prosser, and Peter Bemis who upgraded to the producer level patrons as well as our new producer level patrons. James Stepp, Haley Hastings, Marino, Kelsey Langstaff, Braden Morrison, Matthew Orienter, Taylor Fulton, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withreed, Rosemary Heiss, and Maria Vega. They joined the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Nat- Natalie, Deborah Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Louise, Akansha, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Elisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Anthony, Russell, Jenny, Dustin, Katie, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rosanne, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Chrissy, Shrina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Sammy, Lovekesh, Shivarni, Ali, Kalmage, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Marcus, Zachary, Gabrielle, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brandy, Melody, Kristen, Jonathan, Zach, Elisa, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, Joe, Isabel, Steve, Vivian, Samuel, Ali, Victoria, Kayla, Elena, Takari, Darlene, Brenda, Jackie, and Drake who never make any mistakes entering stations or transferring trains when they get on the subway. (laughs) Can you tell that I moved to New York this week? (laughs) If you want to be like one of these amazing people and get access to bonus content, bonus episodes, exclusive merch, discount on the merch on the regular merch store, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And without further ado, let's get into episode 53 of Potterless, covering chapter 23 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. It's the Horcrux episode, guest starring Potterless's web designer, my girlfriend, and the reason the show exists, Kelly Beckman. Another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that 26-year-old man, and I am here joined for the first time by herself as a guest, though she's been on a few in the past. My girlfriend, Potterless's web designer, and the reason the show exists, Kelly Beckman. Kelly, how's it going? Hello, it's going good. Great. We are here to discuss... This will, at at best, will be all of chapter 23. It might take 12 episodes because chapter 23 is called Horcruxes. And if that's any indication for you listeners out there, it's going to be very intense. This was a very intense chapter for me to read. And how long in advance did you call dibs on these chapters? Was it like Um, the... When you started the podcast. Yeah, I was going to say, was it within seconds or milliseconds of me announcing that I was starting (laughs) Potterless? Yeah, it was right when you did it. Your sister, 
So I called the end of book six, and then your sister was like, wait, I wanted the end of book six. And then Johnny was like, wait, I wanted the end of book six. Yeah, so we've got my girlfriend, my sister, and my best friend all fighting over the same section of the book, which gave me a very early indication, ooh, I bet the sixth book is very good. (laughs) But it was also, actually, we also we wanted the end of the sixth book, Mm -hmm. but when that means, like, three to four chapters, we actually all wanted different pieces. I yes. Wanted, I wanted this chapter. And Megan specifically wanted the Slughorn chapter. Yes. Yeah, so that's the one she wanted. It ended up working out really nicely. It's a good, it's a good book, a uh, good movie. Yeah, yeah, so it was funny because once I finished recording the last episode with my sister where I read chapter 22, I was like, all right, Megan, I gotta go. I have to read chapter 23 because it's called Horror Horcruxes. It's hype. And it was like already two in the morning, I think, at that point, And I just like plowed through the chapter because yeah. I couldn't resist. So it's very intense. Let's get right into this it. This is the first time that I've ever listened to to an audiobook of Harry Potter. I've always listened, I've always read. Mm-hmm. But as I was listening, I took notes. So if you forget anything, I'm gonna point it out. Okay. I, I don't <laughs> think I will. All good. It is really good. So, How about we just read it word for word? I mean, that is probably copyright infringement. So, <laughs> chapter 23 is Horcruxes, and I very much understand that things are about to go down. So Harry runs back in after successfully getting this memory from Slughorn, and he tries to go through the porter hole, but the fat lady says that the password has changed at midnight due to heightened security? Because his luck is wearing off is why this is happening. Oh. Why he's encountering all these, like, things now. uh. He says that he can feel the luck wearing off, and he knows because he almost runs into, like, peeves or something, Mm -hmm. and then he has trouble getting into the portal, and so he can feel the luck. Right. Wearing off. Yeah, he runs into Peeves afterwards. And, okay, this makes a lot more sense. I I was very confused as to why the book was noting these, like, little hiccups. And I thought it was very nonsensical. Now I get it. Thank you for that. Harry doesn't want to deal with this. So he starts sassing about, well, I would take it up with Dumbledore if he wasn't here. And then there's a quote that says, he is here. And I really thought this was going to be Dumbledore right behind Harry. And I was very excited but it's not. It's nearly headless Nick says that the Baron told him the Dumbledore has returned and is back in his office. So Harry runs out and the fat lady feels bad because it was just a joke. And she was just mad at him. Oh, right. She's, she, she was she's, like mad that he woke her up. Yes, exactly. So she was just kidding, I guess. And so she yells the password down the hall at him and I'm like, yeah, that's secure. Exactly. <laughs> Let me just yell it to, I, I guess the only people that would be there would be Gryffindors, but you're right. Not necessarily very secure. It's tapeworm. That's what the password was. <laughs> tapeworm. Though I do support that her passwords are at least random stuff, whereas Dumbledore always picks desserts. That is not very secure. You can just list them. He's Dumbledore. (laughs) Anyway, Harry goes to Dumbledore's office. Dumbledore does his whole thing where he just says enter, which I feel like Dumbledore needs to say something else. It feels like a weird thing just to be like, enter. It's very (laughs) ominous. And also, I don't know, don't you want to check who it is? Like, that's the whole point of knocking. Maybe he's got like the wizard version of uh, security cams down at the base. He's He's got Simply Safe. Yeah, so that's why... You guys want to sponsor me, Simply Safe. I'm right here. (laughs) (laughs) That's also why... um, the passwords are so easy because it's not actually the password letting you in. It's Dumbledore like looking down and being like, oh yeah, it's Harry. It's Dumbledore letting you know which desserts he likes so that Sick. when Christmas and stuff comes around, you know what to get him. Be like, uh-huh. This month I'm really in the mood for lemon drops. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh wait, I'm really in the mood for cockroach clusters now. Yeah, the password has never been Birdie Bots. Dumbledore doesn't like Birdie Bots. <laughs> Harry tells Dumbledore that he got the memory and Dumbledore is very happy. It's so endearing. It's like a proud parent moment he says quote harry this is spectacular news very well done indeed i knew you could do it which just smile tear emoticon all over the place (laughs) dumbledore takes out the pensive pours in the memory they blew skidoo in and we're back at the slughorn tom riddle and his friends chumming it up memory slughorn tells tom that he expects him to be minister for magic in 20 years if he keeps sending him pineapple because he has excellent contacts at the ministry Which I think is funny, given that Tom becomes Voldemort. Yes, that's where the memory went foggy the first time. Right there when he says, I think you could become Minister of Magic, before that was in the old memory, right when it went foggy. He never said that. There were multiple parts in which it went foggy. Yes, but this is the first part where it goes foggy. Mm -hmm. In the old memory, he blocked out the fact that he told him he could be Minister of Magic and that he'd go far. Yes. And he said, you'll go wrong, boy. Mm -hmm. And that was was what he blocked. So he's blocking this out. Exactly. So Tom starts to be coy and his crew clearly knows what's up. They giggle as he says stuff like, I don't think I have the right background for it. Then we get to the part where Tom asks about Horcruxes. Slughorn asks if this is for Defense Against the Dark Arts Project. 
but the book says, quote, Harry could tell that Slughorn knew perfectly well that this was not schoolwork. Tom says he came across the term while reading a book and didn't understand it, which is complete BS, and Slughorn should know better that it's only in that one book in the whole school, but he's not good, slash falls under the witty charm of Tom Riddle. And this is where we went foggy the second time, and he mm-hmm. says, I don't know anything, and don't ask me again. <laughs> exactly. So Tom starts to brown nose, where he does this little like, oh, I just thought a wizard and professor as smart as you would know what a horcrux is. And <laughs> Harry, yeah, narrator Harry, says that he recognizes that he's a master at work, because Harry has done some of this type of stuff I like before. That. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's a game recognized game moment. Yeah, Tom and Harry are very similar mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. They just took very different paths. Yeah, and, and and Dumbledore actually gets into it in this chapter. He talks about how similar they are. They're and very similar. This is one of the ways that they're similar. They're very similar, and they have a similar skill set. It's just a matter of their priorities and personality traits that kind of divide them. But Harry can tell that he really wants to know. He can tell he's being coy, but that mm-hmm. he really, really wants to know. Yes. Slughorn then starts to spill the beans. He says that, oh, I guess an overview can't hurt just to help you understand the term. He tells Tom that, quote, Horcrux is the word used for an object in which a person has concealed part of their soul. So I did not see this coming at all. My guess, I believe, was just that it was some sort of evil, powerful item that made him stronger. I didn't think it was something where you put part of your soul. So I... Don't get any points for guessing this correctly. (laughs) Tom says that he doesn't quite understand, but Harry can sense the excitement in his voice, like you said. Slughorn goes on and says, well, you split your soul, you see, and then you hide part of it in an object outside the body. He explains that if then, even if the body is destroyed, they can't die. Hence, Voldemort with the Potters, that's what happened to him back in the day when Harry was a baby. Yeah, he like should have died, but... But he's got his soul spread out. You're to assume here that he has done this and that's why he didn't die. Yes. Slughorn explains that existence is pain though, saying, quote, few would want it, Tom, very few. Death would be preferable. And we already kind of knew this where people had talked about Voldemort in that state where he was alive was a very rough go and the whole living in the back of Quirrell's head and stuff like that situation. So we know the what it is now. It just told us, and I looked it up, J.K. Rowling has a definition like on her page where she like defined what it is. She mm-hmm. defines it as a receptacle prepared by dark magic in which a dark wizard has intentionally hidden a fragment of his soul for the purpose of attaining immortality. Mm-hmm. So that's like her definition not in the book, but that's the like one that she put out there as the definition. So pretty close to what Slughorn yeah. said. And then he gets into the how, yes. which is like real sketchy now. Like Yeah, this is the part where <laughs> if you say the hide the part, object of the body, sure, that's fine. I, I don't get mad at Slughorn for that. Yeah. When you do the next thing I where do. you explain the whole death thing, kind of, okay. When you go into the description of how it works, like this should have been the red flag here. Tom asks how you split your soul and Slughorn answers him. Yeah. I'm sorry, but what are you doing? I can understand telling him just the general term or the definition of Horcrux. I can even understand the whole, if someone dies while their soul is in a Horcrux, whatever. But when the kid asks you, how do you do it? That should be the biggest red flag. And this is the point where all of my suspicions about Slughorn came true and we're back down to zero good Slytherins in the book so far. Yeah. Because all these people who have been giving me crap for being mean to Slytherins are like, oh, Slughorn's good. No, he's not. So here's the thing about Slughorn that I only actually noticed this time around Mm -hmm. that I think is kind of the nail in his coffin. And I think I mentioned to you earlier, Slughorn does one or two small things for the rest of the time that we know him that are just like proving that he's not full out evil. Mm-hmm. But they, he never really does anything that shows that he's fantastic. This is kind of the nail in the coffin for me. He at least had this suspicion that Voldemort had made Horcruxes because he went so far to repress this memory. So he knew it was important. He knew that this was something that Voldemort had probably pursued and done. So when he disappeared 11 years ago, or I guess at this point, 16 years ago, and everybody thought that he had died, he didn't say anything. He didn't tell anybody like, hey, we should keep looking. He's in a weakened state, but we have to like do everything we can now to 
kill him because he's probably done this. He didn't approach anybody because he only cared about his reputation and he only cared about how he would be perceived and he didn't care about the fact that he he pretty much knew that Voldemort was was not dead, that he was coming back. And he didn't he didn't tell anybody. I can understand him not wanting to look bad and feeling guilty like he helped Voldemort become Voldemort. He did. But at the very least, you gotta tell Dumbledore, and at the very least, you can just be like, hey Dumbledore. Here's what happened. Let me give you the full real memory of what happened. I feel really bad about this. Can we still act on it? And can you please, for my sake, not tell anyone? And I feel like Dumbledore is the kind of person that would mm-hmm. keep that secret. Yeah. Look at what he's been doing for Snape all this time. Yeah, he obviously has some secret for Snape, mm-hmm. as you know. Yeah. And he will not tell anybody why he trusts him because there's some secret. Yeah. Uh, like, first, he didn't do it when Voldemort first fell, and he should have known at that point. That was, like, the prime time to go hunting for, like, these objects. And he then tried to deceive Dumbledore and mm-hmm. give him something else, knowing. And then, like, oh gosh, it's just how stupid can he be? He's just very self-obsessed and doesn't realize that Dumbledore would have kept it secret if Slughorn only asked. But on the flip side, Dumbledore knows that he's got the cloudy memory. Why didn't Dumbledore ask Slughorn and explain this to him? Because clearly he knows what's up. He did. But I guess Slughorn was being stubborn about it because, yeah, he didn't yeah. approach me. He was like, I gave you the memory. It's like, clearly you didn't. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of first time around always wondered, like, this wasn't that important to know. But Dumbledore already knew what a Horcrux was and already had this suspicion that this was happening. Mm-hmm. And he already had this, like, idea. I was like, this memory isn't that important. But actually, going through it again, there are a couple, like, little pieces that you're like, yeah, that kind of puts the puzzle together. Now we know. I guess my concern is less about him getting the detail of this memory, I just would need to know the timeline of how long it took for all of this stuff and when Dumbledore started to suspect that Horcruxes were a thing and multiple Horcruxes were a thing. Because if there was a big enough gap between this conversation between Slughorn and Tom Riddle and then stuff going down, where if Slughorn told Dumbledore earlier, maybe Dumbledore could have acted oh, earlier on you it. you wanted Slughorn to tell Dumbledore like five minutes after this conversation yeah. happened. Yeah, that would be the ideal. Hey, I got a kid oh. that's really good at magic that's asking me very specific questions about Horcruxes. Or whenever... That actually, like, that's what, honestly, what teachers in our school system are supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And that would help, honestly, mental health and yeah. not to get, like, too political school shootings. No, I don't think because that's a matter of can, politics. I think that's a matter of safety. For, it, it's, and I'm not putting that burden on teachers, but teachers do have a responsibility to look for troubled kids mm-hmm. and kids who are being picked on and kids who are being bullied and kids who are obviously very smart and looking into things they shouldn't be looking into. Or kids that are over the top aggressive and over the top violent or have threatened exactly. something. And it's kind Any of, sort of red it's flag. their responsibility to pass that information on and Slughorn didn't. I yes. was saying that it was Slughorn's responsibility when Voldemort was killed i'm mm-hmm. doing air quotes killed yes by the rebounding curse with the potters yeah when he was killed then then it was his responsibility to say okay i'm no longer in danger of voldemort hunting me down and killing me because mm-hmm. he's in a weakened state but we now need to go like yes. confirm that my suspicion yeah and that's why i want to know the timeline because i want to know at what point dumbledore suspected this because dumbledore might uh, have already known I, at that point. i think it was recently Okay. I, th- I think it was recently. And that very well could be. So it makes me upset and I'm disappointed in Slughorn. He was saying in recent years he's been looking into Tom's past. So I think it was okay. after Voldemort came back again. Okay. Well, oh, wait, no, no. that would only would have been two no, years. No, it would so. have been. It's No, no. I mean back again like in Coral's head. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think, and we find out later on because of the diary, I think he like really started being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once when we get into the, the diary, diary, he's like, this is obviously not just regular oh, magic. that's when it first... I think this right. is what it is. So I think that the so, Chamber of Secrets is when he started being like, I should look into his past mm-hmm. and find out as much, as much about him as possible because I have this suspicion now. Yeah, exactly. So yes, Slunkhorn should have told him right away, right when Voldemort was quote unquote killed. Yes. Because Dumbledore didn't learn until book it two. It should have happened. Yeah. Yes. He, it took him 12 years to learn mm-hmm. that he should be looking into Dumbledore or Voldemort's yeah he could have had a 12 year head start on this process <laughs> <laughs> Slughorn <laughs> sucks and this is why there's no good Slytherins I, so I, yeah I'm sorry <laughs> so, yeah I'm waiting for a good one I'm just I, people in real life you can be Slytherins that are will, good people in the books there's not good ones I will tell you and the chapter that I have claimed for the seventh book is this part mm-hmm. there is a part that they butchered in the movies just absolutely butchered it 
as opposed to the line in the book and the line in the movies makes Slytherins even worse than Ooh. they were. And people listening will know, I, hopefully you should know, there are, there are three things that happen in the end of the seventh book that they did in the movies that pisses me off. And this is one of those things. They changed a line in the movie that was, that was different in the book and it made Slytherins worse. Interesting. It, it collectively made all Slytherins worse as opposed to just like the Slytherins that we know being bad being bad and the idea that there are some good Slytherins killed that idea huh well i will have to see what i will let that. you know in like a year or whenever we get there no i'll be finishing it much more soon okay i'll <laughs> so, let you know it, it makes me mad so slughorn says that the soul is supposed to remain intact and splitting it is against nature you split it by committing the supreme act of evil which is murder so to quote the great poet ja rule is murder so they <laughs> so killing rips the soul apart and the wizard intent on creating a horror crux would use the damage to his advantage he would encase the torn potion and then tom asks in case but how and slughorn continues there is a spell do not ask me i do not know do i look as though i have tried it and then tom pulls the whole well just out of curiosity card and asks if there's one horror crux is that really of that much use and then quote i mean for instance which i'm laughing the whole time he's doing these quotes isn't seven the most powerfully magical number wouldn't seven and then slughorn interrupts him merlin's beard tom which love a good merlin's beard and this is the point where slughorn gets a red flag which is way too late there were about yeah. 12 red flags before this one went up yeah, he's now, like, very troubled by what he's done. And now he should be like, man, I just did something bad. Let me go do what I can to redeem this and make this better. He does not take his regret and use it effectively. He nope. takes his regret and buries it deep in his mind. It makes his memories all fuzzy. He's not good. He messes everything. He's not good. So bad. This makes me very happy, though, because in the episode, I believe, with Miel, when we first hear about Horcruxes, she very smartly asked me to guess everything about them yes. and how many there were. And I think I guessed seven. because Why? my Just because it's a magic lucky number. Did like, you guess seven? Yeah. I don't remember this. I did. Well, that, gonna, the episode has not listen. come out yet. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I don't remember listening to that. No, but I, I'm pretty sure she was like, how many do you think there are? Because at this point, my suspicion was that the locket and the ring were horcruxes, but there, there were more. And she was like, how many do you think? And I said, I don't know, seven would make the most sense. It's the only number that would be significant. Seven's that like would a be magical small. number. It's yeah. a religious number. It's like a, historically, it's a powerful number. Exactly. Until you get to, I don't know, 13 or 666, you know, that's the smallest significant number that has some sort of magic or powerful undertone. So I guess that. So I feel good about that. But we don't know that there's actually seven. It's just he's talking about seven and then Dumbledore and Harry suspect there are seven, but then Dumbledore says that that might not be it. There might be less or more or whatever. So I can't celebrate just yet, but I am happy. So this deeply troubles Slughorn. He finally regrets having this conversation and he asks Tom, this is all hypothetical, isn't it? All academic? And Tom says, yes, sir, of course. Yeah, okay, you damn monster. <laughs> so Lockhorn tells Tom not to say a word. Tom turns around and makes the same face that he made when he found out that he was a wizard with Dumbledore back when he was a kid. And this is described by the narrator as not enhancing his handsome features, but making them less human. I don't know why J.K. Rowling is very obsessed with appearances, but this is the first instance in the chapters that we'll be discussing. Later on, I have a much bigger problem. But oh, later on you have a bigger problem than oh, right now? yes. When it, we learn about, uh, what's her name, Prince. Prince and being ugly. Yeah, the, it's, you know, you slam down the picture of what's her name, Prince, it's like, it was a skinny 15-year-old girl. She was not attractive. I thought Rowling was the one who said she wasn't attractive. No, the narrator does. Oh. So I don't understand J.K. Well, Rowling's isn't the narrator, obsession. We're going to cut this out if I'm wrong. Is the narrator... Harry's brain, omnipotent kind Harry, of. first person omnipotent, it's, what is that? Yeah, it's it's very confusing and everyone tries to use it for against me when I say that the put-outer is the put-outer, but yes, it's supposed to be a first person omnipotent where it's like based on the point of view of whoever's in the chapter. But. So Harry's a 16-year-old 16 year old boy, so he's a little piece of garbage. Well, yeah, I don't know, but... Yeah, maybe Harry just sucks. And and if, if that is the case with the narrator, Harry is always obsessed with appearances because he's always calling Tom Riddle attractive and Voldemort ugly and then Sirius attractive and Snape ugly. So we get this weird thing where it's like, if you are good looking, you are good at magic or oh, wow. not mean. And then if you are ugly, you are either evil or bad at magic. Third person limited. Okay. 
Harry Potter is told in third person limited, where the perspective is exclusively grounded to one character, but sometimes cheats a little bit to tell you other things. Yeah, like in but the beginning never, when Harry was a baby. <laughs> yeah, but the narrator doesn't know things that Harry doesn't know. Okay. The narrator's not going to tell you right now, and Voldemort did make the Horcruxes, woo, because mm-hmm. Harry doesn't know that. That makes sense. But this still does not defend the put-outer being the put-outer. I never said it did. We'll see um, when the word delimiter comes in, but it's been called put-outer twice. One time when it wasn't Harry, and one time when it was Harry. So it's the put-outer. Okay, so I did, I did some research. Mm-hmm. Read a bunch of articles, a bunch of Harry Potter wiki, a bunch of fan theories, okay. and then like hunted down what JK herself has approved. Okay. Okay. Only one other person has been known to make a horcrux. Mm-hmm. Herpo the Fowl. In Herpo? Herpo. Sounds very intimidating. H-E-R-P-O the very Fowl. Very intimidating. <laughs> in ancient Greece made a horcrux. And there are very few writings or documentations about horcruxes. Um, the only one is The Secrets of the Darkest Arts. Mm-hmm. Um, tells you what a horcrux is. And it has detailed information on the method for making it. And the consequences of making it. And it was once in the Hogwarts library. And when Dumbledore became headmaster, he removed it. But this scene with Slughorn happened when, I don't know if you remember, at the beginning of the memory, Tom says, is it true that Professor Merrythought is retiring? And Slughorn's like, I don't know where you get your information, boy. You know everything. These are the Jim Dale voices. Oh, okay. I was like, (laughs) like, why does Tom Riddle sound like Hermione? (laughs) Um, Merrythought was still the... um, Headmaster. headmaster at this time. Dumbledore was not the headmaster. When Dumbledore became the headmaster, he removed it and hid it in his office. Oh, so Tom could have actually but read it, it is, in a book. It is believed that Tom had read it while he was at Hogwarts years later. So, or years earlier. So, yes. Yeah, it was so believed Tom that read Tom it. had read it while he was at Hogwarts years earlier. Mm-hmm. So, he already knew what a Horcrux was. He already kind of knew what it was made of what he needed Slughorn from and what I think Dumbledore is about to say. What he needed from Slughorn is to know what happens if I make seven of them. Yeah. And like what happens, can it be done like Mm -hmm. from your experience? Yes. And that's something that even narrator Harry notices where the way in which Voldemort or Tom, I guess, is asking these questions, it's someone that already knows stuff and then is leading up. So it's very much just trying to get that one specific piece of information out of Slughorn. Yeah. And so he had mentioned it was like a spell that does it. The spell is unknown. Rowling said in a 2007 interview, some things are better left unsaid. So exactly Does how it just mean she doesn't, didn't come up I, with a good no, answer? No, I think she knows, all she needs is the name of a spell yeah. to tell you the answer. And I just don't think she wants to tell you the name of the spell. But, okay. Because it's do, unknown to most of the wizarding world, so it can be unknown to us too. But do, do we know how complicated that spell is or how long it takes? Because this is a question I have. Because later on, Dumbledore explains that he thinks that Voldemort uses it for significant deaths. Did he have enough time to make a Horcrux after he killed James before he killed Lily? Because I'm guessing he couldn't do it after he killed Lily because he was in weird, I'm barely alive form. But did he have enough time where like he kills James and then, I don't know, there's a, a quarter on the ground and then he goes, Horcrux! And then he's got part of his soul there and then he tries to kill Lily? Or I don't know what you know right now. I do. Hold on one second. So exactly how it's created was supposed to be was planned out and was supposed to be revealed in something called the Harry Potter Encyclopedia. Mm-hmm. Um, but that book was canceled and it is no longer coming out. And Why? Why would I it don't be know. And I'm so mad about it. It was supposed to be like a Harry Potter Encyclopedia, like a guide that you use to read it, like to finding out more like in depth questions about magic like mm-hmm. this. And it's no longer coming out as of like five or six years ago, maybe. Darn. Pretty sad about it. Start the Kickstarter, JK. Let's make it happen. So, what was your question again? My question is, how long and complicated is the spell to turn a death into a Horcrux afterwards? I was wondering if he did one in between the time where he kills James before he tries to kill Lily and then kill Harry. I think what Dumbledore says later on is that he was going there to use the killing of Harry as the Horcrux making death. Not the killing of James is one, and then the killing of Lily is one, and then the killing of Harry is one. He was there to kill Harry to make a Horcrux because that was significant for him. He wanted it to be his like big finale or yes. whatever. And Dumbledore obviously that did not work out the way he planned. No, I don't think. I, I mean, it's complicated magic. I don't think he could have done 
one for James before mm-hmm. getting up the stairs to Lily. Yeah. The etymology of the word Horcrux is kind of unknown what JK was going for. In mm-hmm. Old English, Hor, H-O-R, or Hor, H-O-R-E, means dirt, evil, or impurity. Ah, and as in the word whore with a W in front of it. Yes, and crux or cruis means container, pitcher, jar. So it's a dirty so container. So it's a container of evil. In or a Greek, dirty glass. Whore can mean boundary. And in Latin, crux can mean like crucify or excruciating or pain mm-hmm. or torture. And in French, whores is outside. So. Uh, and if you shorten, body. this was one that I, th- it's like, all of these are like, you know, within the meaning of Horcrux. Mm-hmm. And then this one I thought was really hilarious. It was like, if you shorten the word whore, it's short for horrible. <laughs> and I was just like. Oh, a, a horrible. <laughs> pff, no, it's that's... a horrible. It's horrible. And crux can mean like cross. Like it's horrible, something you wouldn't do if you followed Jesus. And I was like. Okay, that person doesn't understand how language <laughs> works because clearly the word horrible was based on the Latin word whore. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it was, I was really, I laughed really hard when I read that um, description. So J.K. Rowling described the invention of the horcrux as comparable to the splitting of an atom. Mm-hmm. Quote, something that people imagined might be able to be done but couldn't quite bring it off. And then people started doing it with sometimes catastrophic effects. Sometimes? That's what she what said. Is, I, when is splitting an atom not... Catastrophic. Catastrophic. Yeah, I don't Isn't know. Isn't that the whole point? Did she really say sometimes? I wrote... I, I copied this as the quote. <laughs> um, yep, sometimes catastrophic effects. <laughs> Yeah, big science is J.K. Rowling over here. I feel like it's kind of always kind of no, I mean, yep, uh, 100% of the time. Dumbledore says that the memory confirms the theory that he's been working on for a while, and it tells him how far he still needs to go. So basically, the real reason Dumbledore needed this memory was to confirm that Voldemort is trying to make more than one Horcrux and to try to guess at how many there are. All the headmasters in the portraits start listening. One pulls out an ear trumpet, which is what it I sounds that, like. And that's really funny. <laughs> it's, like, it's like one of those Rico a lot, like big bugle things, but you <laughs> stick it in your ear. And I've never heard of one of these, but I think it's like an old school thing that people used to use. I don't know. But phenomenal. Dumbledore then starts to break it down like he always does for these pensive trips. He says that Tom was trying to figure out all he could do to make himself immortal. He's, Which here, I'm going to intersperse, he's 16. Yeah. He's 16 and he's already, he's Harry's age and he's already like, how can I be immortal? And here's the thing, at this point in time, at this point in the book, Voldemort is about 70, 71. Mm-hmm. And Dumbledore... Damn, he old! Dumbledore, uh, according to Pottermore's 6, birthday... 6,000. According to Pottermore's birth date, he's 115 or 116. But according to Rowling's interview, she says he's about 150. So Dumbledore is still older than Voldemort at this point. And, like, I think much more spry than Voldemort in some senses. Like, Voldemort is inhuman still. So pretty much he could just keep living if he just, like, you know, ate Eats some his veggies. veggies. <laughs> <laughs> I th- I, yeah, I mean, they do talk about the whole splitting of the soul and it taking a toll on you and it being against nature so i guess it could go in that regard i don't know but yeah i mean no matter what whether or not he's immortal or whatever he looks super ugly what are you doing he's got no nose so dumbledore suspects that he's already split his soul into more than two and he thinks that he's the only wizard to ever do so he says that four years ago he first received proof that Voldemort did so, and this proof is the diary from book two, which I found very shocking, because now book two actually matters. People had told me this. I think somebody said this in one of your episodes. I think it was when Alex and I Mm -hmm. did that episode. He asked me what my least favorite was, if Mm -hmm. it wasn't five, and I said it was two. And I agreed. And I think he was like, no, two's important. Remember, that's when shit starts happening. And I was like, oh, shoot. It's one of those where I guess that like there are things in two that become better later but it doesn't make the book better no but it is when like, it gives you a new perspective when you reread it i guess but it doesn't make the book any better yeah <laughs> i guess it lays implications and it has the groundwork and the formation of the stuff that happens but with this chapter especially and as i've gone past them and what i'm assuming the rest of the book i don't understand anybody that it, the sixth book isn't their favorite i can, it's so much better than all the other ones sixth book is the best it's not even close i liked three a lot and the plot twists were fun but this is a whole nother level of book it's yeah. incredible it is a very captivating novel and i yeah. don't understand people who don't like it or at the very least have it in their top two yeah so the diary was his first 
clue. Because mm-hmm. Dumbledore's first yes. clue that this was a thing. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the diary. Yes. Dumbledore says that though he never saw the version of Riddle that came out of the diary himself, from what Harry told him, this was something he'd never come across before. And this was his first inclination that Horcruxes were something that Voldemort was using. A memory thinking for itself had to be some sort of powerful dark magic. That's what tipped him off. And he says, quote, What intrigued me and alarmed me most was that the diary had been intended as a weapon as much as a safeguard. Harry says he doesn't understand. Dumbledore says that as a safeguard, it did its job in keeping its owner alive. But he goes on that clearly Riddle wanted the diary read so that Slytherin's monster would be unleashed and wreak havoc on the school. And people would know that Voldemort was Slytherin's heir Mm -hmm. because he couldn't tell people at that time, but he wanted them to know it was him. Yes. It was pride. Exact quote from Harry. He wanted people to know that he was Slytherin's heir because he couldn't take credit at the time. So why, refresh my memory because it's been a while since I've read the second book, what about the diary proved that he was a Slytherin's heir aside from the blood message on the wall that was like... Only Slytherin's heir can unlock the beast Uh and he was the one who did it. Okay. So the beast was unlocked back when Tom Riddle was in school Mm -hmm. and he couldn't take credit for it and Hagrid took the downfall. Uh He wanted to take credit for it because it was obvious it was the Slytherin's heir who did it, but he wasn't powerful enough yet to come out as like as dark as he was. Okay. He didn't want to, I'm sure as a 16 year old before he was like taken over the world, he didn't want to be like imprisoned and everybody to know he had big dark ambitions. So he couldn't take credit for it at the time. So this diary unlocks it. It's a weapon for unlocking the monster again. And this time, everybody will know, since you know his memory was like starting to take physical form by stealing Ginny's soul, uh-huh. everybody would know it was him who had done it. Mm-hmm. And now he couldn't really get in trouble for it because he's already you yeah. know, the most sought-after dark wizard. Why so. is it that Slytherin's heir is the only one that can unlock it, though? Because It's the one who can control... It can Somehow Slytherin's heir controls the basilisk. Isn't that right? I don't. I'm confused of why it proves that it's Slytherin's heir because wasn't it just you go to the bathroom and you pull the snake thing? No, you had to speak Parseltongue to it and that's also a um, Slytherin. Oh, you had to speak Parseltongue to the statue. Yeah. So And Harry's the only one who's not related to Slytherin who can speak Parseltongue. Oh, oh, okay. I think. Okay. No, that makes sense. He's the only one we've met that can sure. speak Parseltongue that is not Slytherin's heir. Okay. So in the second book, Tom Riddle, the whole thing was diary possess Ginny and then possessed Ginny could speak parcel tongue and yes. then yeah that's, that's how, how she opened the chamber okay. right and i don't know if this is just a movie thing or if this happened in the book too he starts to take physical form in the end he's basically slowly sucking the life force out of Ginny and becoming a physical being right yes they're okay. basically gonna swap where yeah. Ginny becomes only a soul okay that's that what is I thought. trapped so yeah that diary yes. here's the thing one thing i didn't notice i or i didn't realize when you create a horcrux, mm-hmm. and it makes total sense, when you create a horcrux, you're taking a piece of your soul that is frozen in that time. So he was frozen as a 16-year-old boy mm-hmm. in that diary, and that's why he came out as a 16-year-old riddle. Who did he kill to make that happen? Moaning Myrtle. What? Is that revealed in the actual books? I don't think so. Okay. That's something that Rowling but the, oh, let well, us know. Oh, Which no, ma- you know makes the- sense, because the snake killed Moaning Myrtle. Exactly, and it was uh, Voldemort. Voldemort was like, killed a girl. Uh, and then... Uh, the snake bit him, bit the girl, and that was significant for him because it was his first kill. And you proved that and he was used, the heir it was to do it. It was all related with the heir and the Slytherin and the chamber and everything. Wow. And so he was like, kill the girl, first kill, aha, Horcrux, and then made a Horcrux using the book. Wow. Yeah, so that's the first one right there. Wow. Cool, 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 cool. I'm pretty sure you don't find that out in the book no, if I just spoiled something my if bad. If you did, it's not a big deal because I already knew that the snake... I'm pretty sure you can piece that together. Uh, yes. This was not a reveal of any information that I didn't know. It's just piecing information yeah. together I that I already knew. I looked up who he killed to create each Horcrux mm-hmm. and it was mostly new information to me. So I don't think that it was something you learned in the books. Okay. I think that it's something that JK told us later on. Sure. Just like or how like there's a bunch of Jewish kids at the school. That you can imply, but were never explicitly stated. Like Moaning Myrtle being the diary. It makes sense because she died around the time that he created the diary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she died at his hand, mm-hmm. essentially. Whoa there, past Mike. Let's take a step back because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. <laughs> Chapter 
Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. If you're anything like me, when you're being a big fancy boy and getting cocktails at a bar, you want to be adventurous and spontaneous, and that translates to ordering something with an ingredient that you don't understand what that word means. Well, that's where Shaker and Spoon comes in, because you can still be this adventurous, but not spend a crazy amount of money doing so. Shaker and Spoon sends you a box of all sorts of ingredients to make four different cocktails based on the same alcohol. They send you all the other ingredients and recipes and instructions. All you need to do is buy the matching bottle of liquor, and then you can make a whole bunch of fun and adventurous drinks. I'll tell you what happened when I got my first box. So I ordered the box that was based on the liquor Amaro, which I've never had before. It's kind of like vodka meets spiced rum. It was very good. I've never heard of it before, so I thought this would be great. So I hosted a get-together after one of my improv shows, inviting my whole team, and I looked very fancy. They sent you enough materials to make four of each cocktail, which is fantastic, because then for this party, I had 16 drinks, which was great. Great. So it was very fun. It was very cost effective. And if you wanted to be even more cost effective, my listeners get $20 off their first box when they sign up at shakerandspoon.com slash potterless. It's a great service. You can skip whenever you want. You can cancel whenever you want. It's fantastic. The next box that they have going out is the Rums of Origin box, which is a great way to transition from the summer into the fall. It's great. I really enjoyed the service and I can't wait to get my next box. Again, that is shakerandspoon.com slash potterless to get $20 off your first box. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by the app If you're anything like me, you get a much better sleep when you are nice and relaxed before you hit the hay. But if you're also anything like me, that is the time when you are the most stressed because your brain realizes, he's alone with his thoughts. Let's flood him with all the stressful things. That's where Calm comes in. Calm is an app that gives you guided meditations based on whatever you want. You can custom tailor the meditations to help you reduce stress and anxiety or to get more focused or just help you fall asleep. Calm is great. I've used it to focus and de-stress before I do a bunch of work. I've used it to help calm me down before I go to sleep. I've used it to help me fall asleep on a plane faster. And my listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription when they go to calm.com slash potterless. It includes hundreds of hours of meditation and it's why Calm won Apple's 2017 app of the year, making them the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. Again, if you go to calm.com slash potterless, you can get 25% off a premium membership and start doing your daily guided meditation today. Dumbledore is scared of how Blase Voldemort treated the Horcrux, leading him to believe that Voldemort made or was planning to make more. He further confirms this when Harry told Dumbledore that Voldemort said he had, quote, gone further than anyone along the path that leads to immortality when he was giving his whole big villain monologue when Harry was trapped in the fourth book at the big showdown. Dumbledore cites Voldemort's transformation into a being that is less and less human as a reaction to his soul splitting and getting mutilated. As this happens, he becomes less of a person and more of just this evil form. Yeah, I read up on this as well, the dehumanization of Voldemort. Mm -hmm. It's implied that creating Horcruxes is what created Voldemort's distorted appearance, but it's not entirely known what really created his appearance like that. Plastic surgery. (laughs) I want my nose to look like a snake. I I mean, we've seen many a celebrity whittle their nose into less and less and less. Oh my gosh. Voldemort is just, get Uh, rid of it. Dumbledore once stated, and I I found this in my research, but I couldn't figure out where he once stated it. Dumbledore once stated that Voldemort had undergone magical transformation separate to the creation of Horcruxes. So... It could be the Horcruxes dehumanizing him. It could be, you know, how he reincarnated himself. It could be that reincarnation process that dehumanized him. Or it could be something else. It could be all the things. But it really closely knits together humanity and morality. Mm-hmm. By the creation of Horcruxes, you look less human, the less moral you become. Mm-hmm. The more immortal you become. Yeah. Harry asks why... Voldemort doesn't just use the Sorcerer's Stone. Dumbledore says that he doesn't think Voldemort likes the idea of having to depend on something in order to stay alive. Quote, Voldemort likes to operate alone. Dumbledore thinks that splitting the soul into seven would appeal to Voldemort, meaning that there are six Horcruxes total because the soul that's actually still in him counts as one. So Dumbledore says that Harry has destroyed one, the diary, and Dumbledore has destroyed another, the ring, which I was right. I knew it. And he explains that his mutilated hand is why. I was very happy with myself. Can you guess who Voldemort killed to make that? For the ring? Yeah. Um, Oh, well, that happened right after he killed his parents. So I'd guess one of them. Yeah. Probably his dad. Tom Sr. Yeah. Yeah. That was his 
significant death. He was killing off his muggleness or whatever. Yeah, so now the diary, we have a good guess. Ring, we have a good guess. The locket, we don't know because the memory, we just saw him getting the locket and then Hufflepuff's cup. I wrote in and all caps right here in my notes, we are closer to the secret of finishing Lord Voldemort than anyone has ever been before. I got so <laughs> hyped and I was like, all caps, I was like, ah! <laughs> just like typing this out. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know who would be the other deaths because I don't think that killing that fat rich lady is significant enough to be put into the locket or the cup so Dumbledore says that there was a nasty curse on it and that's why his hand got all screwed up <laughs> but then he has this great quote where he says forgive me the lack of seemly modesty my prodigious skill is <laughs> what allowed him to defeat the nasty curse that was on the ring which is great he's really just trying to be as succinct as possible and not beat around the bush and he's like look this is gonna sound like I'm bragging but I'm really fucking good at magic and that's why I <laughs> was able to kill this ring. <laughs> I absolutely love it. He says that the other key was Snape's action when he returned to Hogwarts. He might have died. So we'll learn this in a couple chapters that we discuss. But Snape is really good at saving people when they're just about to die. <laughs> He's got great timing. It is no secret that Snape is the lord of timing because he always happens to see Harry anytime he does something that is worthy of removing house cut points. But clearly Snape's timing extends to save people's lives. Hmm. Harry asks how Dumbledore knew. Dumbledore says that for many years he has made it his business to learn the past life of Voldemort, further saying that he stumbled upon the ring in the ruin of Gaunt's place, which I think is a stupid dumb move of Voldemort. I understand that Voldemort is obsessed with all of the meaning behind all of these things and the magpie-like tendencies, blah, 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 blah. If you really just want to be immortal, you kill random people and you put them in random things in random locations. You take someone out on a boat, you kill them, you turn a pebble into Horcrux, and you throw it into the ocean. <laughs> and you do that 20 times oh in different bodies of water. You go, you're going to your old family's place and hiding it in a very obvious object. Like I, I understand that he put a bunch of protections on it oh, and curses me. and all this other stuff. But if you really want to be immortal... Sure, have the special ones. Make one where you killed Joe from down the street and you put him in a penny and you flicked him into a fountain. Like, uh, I don't... Uh, Voldemort. <laughs> so, um, the whole idea of a soul container, this is apparently a very common trope. Okay. To have a soul container is a very common thing in fairy tales. There is this one Slavic folklore, which is kind of the oldest folklore that uses this trope. Mm -hmm. And in this one... He hides his soul inside a needle, which is inside an egg, which is inside a duck, which is inside a hare, which is in an iron chest, which is buried under a green oak tree, which is on the island in the ocean. So as long as that's safe, he cannot die. So that's what he did. Yeah, that guy's smart. a very smart. random thing. That's super smart. Yeah. If Voldemort hasn't done this for so one of the horcruxes, really cool. he's an idiot. If one horcrux is inside of a thing, buried in a thing on a remote island under a tree in the middle of the ocean, I will be very proud of Voldemort. But if they're all just in these big items in very significant locations to Voldemort, it's I will pride. be very disappointed. Voldemort's biggest downfall is pride. Hubris defeats the worst of villains. It, it, I mean, in this case, it does. <laughs> he becomes very predictable mm -hmm. because of this flaw that he has, which is pride. Yeah. He doesn't think anybody's going to be able to step to him. Yeah. So I mentioned that this is a common trope, an object that can hold a person's soul outside of their body. And so I did a little research on that common trope, where it's used and how it's used. There are two types of soul containers in folklore and film and cartoons and all this kind of stuff. Yeti um, thermoses <laughs> and those Ziploc things that are really cheap to get at Target. <laughs> Just go to the container store. <laughs> get the glass tupperware. Glass tupperware is so good, though. Can we just <laughs> shout out to glass tupperware for being incredible? I love my glass tupperware. It's I the best. You. It's so phenomenal. But the two types of soul containers, one type is that you cannot be physically killed while the jar is intact someplace else. So example of this, parts of the Caribbean, Davy Jones uh -huh. takes his heart and puts it in his Which chest. Which parts of the Caribbean? I don't remember Dead anything. man's chest. Oh, oh. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and so he gets like stabbed and he's like, ah, la, 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 I'm still here because you have to kill the heart. That's the first type. Mm -hmm. The second type is you can be physically killed, but you can be resurrected because is, you've got this. And, and this that's what this, this type method. is because it's horcruxes. So we're back in when he does the expected, not expected Patronum, Vaticadavra on baby Harry, bounces back, kills him. 
is he like a spectral type being? Because di- wasn't it like he went, he like possessed snakes and stuff? Yeah, he becomes like a spectral type. He comes like a, like a, a ghost. spirit or something. Yeah, he's not physical he's at not all. He's not a physical thing. Okay, and that's why he was point. able to go and to he start, animals. Yeah, he starts possessing and animals. Coral's head, Coral's head. And then in the fourth book, they do the whole. He does some dark thing. magic to like be able to do these things. Yeah. So in other folklore and stuff, for this second type where you can be physically killed but you're resurrected, when you're resurrected, either the jar grows into the replacement you or, yeah, like the jar be, like grows into a thing. Oh, like wow. the container, whatever it is, grows into a thing. And the second type is that you can then hijack somebody's body or in this case, case like create a body using magic and stuff. Ah. Apparently this is a common trope in Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, it happens in the Adventure Zone. It's called phylactery. Okay. Which comes from the ancient Greek phylacterion. Don't worry, you're going to get yelled at by everyone on Twitter. <laughs> uh, I'm Greek and... <laughs> but that means to guard or protect. So okay. that word is a lot closer to a meaning than Horcrux, which we already determined. No, well, hor- Horcrux. Horcrux, if you shorten the word horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so common things in folklore that people used to, you're mad about the fact that he's like being so obvious. Common yeah. things in stories and for- folklores were paintings, gems, still beating hearts, yeah. eggs, and trees. Well, eggs is very dumb. Yeah, I don't We've understand We've all that. heard about Humpty Dumpty. Oh, no. It's eggs for fairy tales. It's usually in eggs or trees okay. for like more darker fairy folklore beating hearts beating hearts it's like what davy jones is right so i just then started thinking i was like i was like yeah this is this does happen a lot happens in aladdin the return of jafar i don't remember anything about (laughs) that they basically destroy his genie lamp and that destroys him anastasia what's his name has those green glowing things and that's like his soul okay it's contained in that it's like an evil um, the Black Cauldron, which is another animated movie. All Dogs Go to Heaven. What? Another animated movie. The Penguins of Madagascar. Ooh, I'm sorry. I haven't seen that one. I looked that up, but apparently that's a thing. And then Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I don't know. Totally. You're I didn't even the think Lord about of the Rings that. expert. No, I mean, think about it. The the ring itself, uh-huh. the whole quest is to, is to destroy the ring. And if yeah. they destroy the ring, they destroy him. Uh, He's okay. living as this eye sure. in a tower. Mm-hmm. They're not like going and stabbing the eye, right? The way to kill that spirit is to kill what it's basically contained in. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, you know, a, a container, a ring. It's hidden on this ring and they have to destroy that. And they have to use very powerful means to destroy it. Then you'll get into it. You know the tales I, of Beetle the Bard is. I know that exists, but I have no you idea. You know that it exists. It'll come up again in that. I know nothing that. about it. It'll okay. come up in that. And then the whole time we were reading this chapter, this is what I was thinking about. The song Jar of Hearts. <laughs> Jar of okay, Hearts. Okay, stop playing it so I don't get yelled at by a copyright company. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I do not think that's what Jar of Hearts is about. It's not what Jar, Jar of Hearts, Hearts is about. <laughs> but I just thought it was absolutely hilarious. As soon as I read, like, in these descriptions of, like, soul containers, as soon as somebody called it a jar, I was like, ah! <laughs> it's a Jar of Hearts. <laughs> so he hid it in the shack under many powerful enchantments, never guessing that Dumbledore would make the trouble to visit the ruins or search for traces of magical concealment. He was also, like, so secretive about his life, he didn't think that Dumbledore would ever know about the Gaunts, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, he didn't think anybody would know. He underestimated Dumbledore big time. Harry thinks that they're screwed because Voldemort could just make it junk, which is what my thought is, but Dumbledore says that there's no way that Voldemort wouldn't put it in some sort of trophy, Pride. citing his... Yep, his pride and his magpie tendencies. Favoring objects worthy of honor was the quote. Dumbledore says he thinks Voldemort would want to put his soul into objects with some sort of powerful magical history. Harry has a great quote where he says, the diary wasn't that special, which I love. Dumbledore says the diary is proof that he was the heir of Slytherin. I was confused about how. We've already cleared that up. Dumbledore suspects that the locket and that Hufflepuff's cup are both horcruxes, meaning that... We know about two, which are destroyed. We have two more that Dumbledore suspects, and we have two that are a mystery. Dumbledore's thought is that one would be either a Gryffindor item or a Ravenclaw item, but he's not sure. He doesn't suspect Gryffindor because the only known heirloom from Gryffindor is the sword, which Dumbledore has safe watch over. So maybe it's something from Ravenclaw? Harry asks if Dumbledore thinks Voldemort only wanted to come back to Hogwarts to get a hold of fancy artifacts, yes. and Dumbledore agrees. Dumbledore's like, I have my suspicions. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Dumbledore thinks that since he wasn't able to get an item from both Ravenclaw and Gryffindor, that the sixth Horcrux is Nagini, which Harry asks the exact same question I asked 
which was you can use animals as horcruxes. So is there any sort of limit on what can be a horcrux? Because all in the description, they say object, 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 object. And now we've made it a animal. Nowhere is it, as we discussed, there's like no precedence for this. There's no writings about this. I'm sure that he was like, I want to try this and try it. And he was like, if I kill the snake, kill the snake. And then like tried it out and it worked. So he was like. I guess at this point, it's like, what's the limit? Can you turn a person into a horcrux? I mean... Again, I don't think that would be smart. Again... But wizards like, last a really long time. They go into the fact that making a living thing a horcrux is very unpredictable because mm-hmm. that thing can be killed. Sure. And that thing has its own will as well and it's harder to control. Again, there's no precedent for any of this stuff. So yeah. you don't really know what the limits are for horcruxes. Okay. So Dumbledore also thinks that Voldemort went into killing Harry's parents, trying to kill baby Harry, one shy of his goal of six Horcruxes so that his soul would be split into seven parts. He thinks that he saves Horcruxes for significant deaths, and he wants to make the final one killing Harry because... It's his crown jewel. Yes, it's his crown jewel, and it basically confirms that I have conquered the threat that the prophecy foretold now that i have killed this baby he is the last horcrux because now i don't have to worry about anyone else for the rest of my life i'm just going to be immortal and i'm all good from here on out yes allegedly yeah allegedly. i feel like a lawyer everything i have to say is like (laughs) allegedly the plaintiff did this allegedly (laughs) the alleged accusation against my defendant here sources say uh so dumbledore thinks he may have used frank to turn nagini into the sixth and the final horcrux because Nagini underlines the Slytherin connection and Frank is still a tie to his old parents because he's tending the grounds at his old house, right? I think at this point, Voldemort's what? been kind of put through the ringer and he'll take what he can get. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, not like, sure, you're significant. I, I mean, need another one. It, it, there's like some stuff that Rowling has said that's not in the books where she's talked about who he killed for different things mm-hmm. and it kind of breaks into the Dumbledore's theory that it was all significant deaths. Okay. Some of them are significant and some of them, it's like that's not very significant. Okay. Harry in the book does this very cute little narrator summary, much like I did, where he's like, okay, so two are gone, we know what two are, and we don't know about the other two. Yeah, so here I wrote out a list. I went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What do we got? And Dumbledore says, an admirably succinct and accurate summary, yes. Which I think is a great little kind of meta joke where J.K. Rowling is very much making it known that, yes, the purpose of Harry saying this quote is to catch the children readers up to speed. That quote from Harry, we don't know any of that in the movies. In the movies... Harry is left with zero direction. He knows about the diary, the ring, the locket, and the peace in Voldemort. Mm-hmm. And he knows nothing because they didn't go into every trip in the Pensieve. Which is a mistake because that's the best part of these books. It's the best part of these books and they didn't do it. And it just ruins the whole like Easter egg hunt throughout this book of trying to pick out what's significant. The most intense Easter egg hunt the ever. Most, yeah, the most intense <laughs> Easter egg hunt for your life. What's inside the egg? Oh, oh God, I thought it was going to be Hershey's. It's a piece of soul. Oh, no. <laughs> but like, I mean, they did hide them in eggs and fairy tales. Here's the thing. So. What is worse inside an Easter egg? A soul or one of those damn carnival peanuts? Oh my gosh. Mm, I think carnival peanuts. <laughs> Wait, you kill oh, sorry, a piece circus of soul. peanuts. Circus peanuts. Um, it's an insult to the carnivals. <laughs> yeah, you know, circus peanuts. Here's the big debate: What's worse, circus peanuts or candy corn? They're both horrible. Oh, circus peanuts. I would think so too because I they have, just taste like insulation. Once or twice in my life, I have craved candy corn. And then I ate one and I was like, eh. Why did I do this? Candy corn is the ultimate. I see a bowl of it and I'm like, maybe I'll like it. And yes. every time it's bad. Because other food oh. that I've had in my life, I used to not like and now I like. I didn't use, I used to not be a fan of oranges. I used to not be a fan of green olives. I used to not be a fan of lettuce. And as time lettuce. went on, I didn't like lettuce that wasn't crunchy. I didn't like the leafy feel. So I liked iceberg and things that had good like <sighs> to it. But I didn't like a salad that had like was arugula spinach? based or spinach based. Because it was all just kind of like leafy and annoying to chew. I think it was just when I was little and it was harder to chew. I was a difficult child. I didn't like cheese. So I wouldn't eat pizza. You didn't like cheese or pizza? Yeah. And you know like cheese what? strings and stuff like that. You didn't like string cheese as a kid? And my brother didn't like peanut butter. So my mom had so much trouble making food for us. Oh my God. You got, <laughs> what like, what you guys eat? are the what worst? Do we eat? <laughs> well, I can't imagine if I was a parent and I had kids that didn't like the two best foods. Cheese and peanut yeah, butter. Yeah. I, like, I like cheese now. But my brother still will not eat peanut butter. 
his loss. I mean, it makes him like sick, so he won't eat it. He's Maybe not. He's, he's not allergic because he eats like Chick Fil A, which is peanut oil. Uh-huh. So he's not allergic, but he just like can't. Like you open one Dude, like ten loss, feet away man. from him, and he'll be like, "Get that out of here, please." Like, wow. Can't do it. Anyway, Sucks so yeah, Harry knows none of this in the movies, and like the, when I watched the movies and the sixth movie end, and I was like, "What?" Harry has no direction. The whole series has no direction right now. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know what to look for. He has no idea. And and then like in the seventh movies, which are two, he just like stumbles through and figures it out. It out. And like Hermione does her logic to like fill in these gaps of what we have not learned because this chapter does not happen. That's as, stupid. Like, this like is the most should. important chapter in the series so far. It kills the best mystery and most well laid out plan. Of the Harry Potter series. This has been going on since the second book. Mm-hmm. This whole scheme has been happening. Oh, I'm so mad about it. This is the second thing that the movies have killed that the books did perfectly. This is the first Ginny? Oh, I... Well, no. The first was what I said about the uh, thing that happens with Slytherin. Okay, well, they also murdered Ginny. Yes, they did. <laughs> She's so good. The script writer of the seventh movie, mm-hmm. Stephen Clove, says the way that he justifies it he says horcruxes leave traces of dark magic and that by touching one, like they find one, the one that they're looking for, the locket or like whatever, by touching it, they can see visions of the other. And that's not how it happens in the book. And that's how they justify it in the movie for cutting out everything. They like find one and it leads them to another and they find the other and it leads them to another. And it's like, that's, that's not how it works. That's super stupid. It's so much worse. Yeah, that's really dumb. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense because in the second book, Harry would have stabbed the book and then Seen he would have like been, yeah. The ring hey, Dumbledore, when I shanked this book, all I could see was a ring. Do you know what's going on? What does that mean? What? And Dumbledore would be like, oh, the pieces are coming together. But <laughs> that's not how it happened. That's just how the script writer dealt with the fact that the sixth movie had been done wrong. Gross. Gross, 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 gross. Not hot take. People don't like the movies. <laughs> Harry asks if Dumbledore constantly That's what leaving. I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> Harry asks if Dumbledore constantly leaving is in search for the Horcruxes. Dumbledore says yes. Yes. And he says that he thinks he is close to finding another. Harry asks if he can join. And plot twist: Dumbledore says yes. Yes. So that is quite. Quite good for Harry. Harry is even shocked. He's taken aback, and Dumbledore says, I think you've earned the right, which is true. Some of the headmaster paintings, though, do not agree. They are not impressed with the decision. And we get the best quote, which is, Phineas Nigelis actually snorted. God, I love Phineas Nigelis so much. So, 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 so much. I'd like some spinoff um, Oh, please. Works on him. Give me a Phineas Nigelis spinoff book. He was Slytherin. He was. Right? He's I black. hope not. He's a black. Oh no! Yeah, that's why he can no! go to the box house. Oh, I like a Slytherin. No, no, please let him be in any other house. Phineas Nigelis Black was a pureblood wizard, possibly oh, the son no. of Sinish and uh, Ella Black, and uh-huh. brother of Sirius, uh-huh. Eladora, and uh-huh. Lola Black. Uh-huh. He attended Hogwarts as a member of Slytherin House. No, I like a Slytherin. Later becoming the school's least popular headmaster. What? Loathing his profession. I mean, yeah, he probably still is true to the fact that there's no good Slytherins. I just like him because he's so sassy. Harry asks if Voldemort knows when a Horcrux is destroyed. Dumbledore says that he thinks not. He says he knows Voldemort did not know about the diary being destroyed because he didn't learn about the truth of it until he forced the truth out of Lucius Malfoy. The movies killed this too. The movies kill everything. You can feel it when they kill them. uh, This we can just stop saying that the movies killed this because I think it goes without saying. Dumbledore clarifies that it was Voldemort's plan to have Lucius smuggle the diary into Hogwarts, but he was supposed to wait for Voldemort's order, which never came because Voldemort got murked by Harry and Lucius thought that he was never coming back. Lucius did not know what the diary truly was or what it did, but he carried out the diary plan for his own ends by sicking it on Arthur's daughter to try and discredit Arthur and remove a highly incriminating magical item all in one foul swoop. And Dumbledore thinks that this might be why he's angry with Lucius Mm. now. Like why he's so pissed Mm. off at Lucius. Exactly. Dumbledore says that with this situation plus the ministry fiasco, he thinks that Lucius might be thankful to be safe in Azkaban right now, which is quite a testament to how powerful Voldemort is, is that it's preferable to be in a situation where your soul is slowly getting removed from you and turning you into a vegetable. Harry asks if destroying all the Horcruxes mean that Voldemort can be killed, and Dumbledore says yes, that he will become a mortal man with a diminished soul, but his mind and his powers will still be intact, so it's still going to be really hard and will take, quote, uncommon skill and power to kill him. 
And Harry replies, but I haven't got uncommon skill and power. Yes, you have. I know, I can love. And the narrator says, quote, it was only with difficulty that he stopped himself adding big deal. <laughs> Which I think is so good. <laughs> ah, I can love big whoop, Dumbledore. <laughs> Dumbledore then clarifies that you are still too young to understand how unusual you are, Harry, which I think is a very nice and kind of ominous in a good way sounding quote. Harry asks if the part of the prophecy that says he will have the power that the Dark Lord will know not just means love. And Dumbledore says yes, and then Harry feels a bit let down by this. He's like, I thought I was going to be cool. It's like, oh man, I thought I was going to know how to do like lightning bolts or heat vision or super speed. But no, you just get love. Or just like be really good at magic. Sure. Because yeah. you can do all those things with magic. He mm -hmm. just thought he might be like really good at magic. Yep, but he's basically For that, I say, study, Harry. Pay yeah. attention in your freaking classes. Yeah, or just keep reading your and nice potions. learn book. something. Yeah, like, that would help. But yeah, he basically gets stuck with the equivalent of the heart ring in Captain Planet and Planet Tears, which we learn is the best ring because it can be used for mind control. Ooh. I don't know what you're talking about. You've never watched Captain Planet and Planet Tears? No. All right, guys, this episode of Pyros is over. Um, we'll resume after Kelly's watched every episode. You didn't? Captain Planet? Silver dude with the green mullet and the kids are what all What time of our countries. childhood did this They're, come out? When we were kids in the 90s. I didn't really watch. We didn't have. We didn't have fun. I mean, we played outside. Captain Planet. He's a hero. Earth, wind, water, fire, heart. And they all have the rings. And then our powers combined create <laughs> Captain Planet. Silver dude, red shirt. It's got the yellow globe on it. He's got a green mullet. The power is yours. And they <laughs> defeat pollution monsters and sludge monsters and then in between like before commercial breaks they teach you how to recycle and stuff it's the best i mean it sounds great it sounds it's like a show wonderful. i really would have liked but all i watched when i was little was arthur Ooh, well i love arthur I mean, he's fine i mean having fun's not hard many for library card exactly <laughs> but captain planet speaking of which i was gonna get these books from the library uh -huh. to read it and guess what you don't have the library card mm -hmm. so instead i got uh there's posted on a group in my neighborhood, there's like a buy nothing group. Mm -hmm. Somebody was giving away the fifth, sixth, and seventh book. So, shout out to Buy Nothing Tribeca. I went and got a, some books for this to read for this. And as she was giving it to me, she was like, "If you find any post-it notes in there, that's just my kid. As as uh, he was reading the books, he wanted to take notes about his thoughts. And I, I tried to get them all out, but I, I like, was like, no, I wanted to see them. I found one. Uh -huh. It's for after chapter twenty seven, which is not part of our scope, mm -hmm. but it says. How could he? And then he drew a picture of a really, really ugly, squiggly Snape. And it's <laughs> so funny. And Snape's just saying, duh. <laughs> That's so good. I love it. I'm really That's excited to read chapter 27. That's the only one. Oh, I would have loved to see all of these. That would have been so good. Uh, I like that. I he, know. I was like, why'd you take them out? <laughs> yeah, I like that this kid took the effort to write it on post-it notes. I just bought a used copy on Amazon, and I write in my actual book a lot of stuff, which people on Instagram get very upset about. And so would Madame uh, Pince. Well, it's an, well, Madame Pince, because it's a library book, this is my additional copy on purpose so that no, I can write No, she was the, mad at Harry. Remember that scene because where... Because she thought it was a library book. No, and he says, this is mine, and she still tries to... She's oh. like, he goes, this is not a library book, this is mine. And she's like, ah! And she's like still trying to grab it well, from Madame him. Madame Pince sucks. You poor child! She, How dare you! She should marry, what's his face, Filch, and no. they, can, they have a thing, and they should just become the worst couple ever together and have horrible... Madam Pence is just like bad. a quintessential librarian. Everything should be quiet yeah. and clean. Filch is just an evil child torturer. Yeah, he sucks a lot. He's super bad. I had a really bad librarian in my high school. She was bad. She was really bad. There was one time where I was using my calculator to do math homework, and she came over, and she was like, son, which is what she called everybody, son. I went to an all-boys high school, so everyone was son. So she walked over, and she goes, son... I'm going to need your cell phone. And I was like, what? She's like, I see you playing with your cell phone. And I was like, Ms. what? I don't. What are you talking about? She's like, right there. And on my lap was my TI-84. <laughs> and I was like, you mean this? Look at this. Your cell and phone. Was, and then she didn't even say sorry. She just went, oh, resume. And then goes back to the desk. So I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm texting in the library I after school. <laughs> I don't understand the um, bad librarian trope. I always take dead library. I've... I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I mean, I guess people don't like being told to be shush or whatever. I've always had good experience. People don't with, like rules. Is that what I, you're saying? I don't know. I've always had I've always had good experience with librarians in real life, but 
Yes, lead. in real life. Yeah, my librarian in middle school was dope. She was the coolest. They were always like really sweet ladies who did the AR reading contests, like. And then helped you get books. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. So Dumbledore confirms that it is just love that is this extra power, and he gets a bit impatient with Harry because Harry keeps going on and on about how all of the power within his ability to defeat Voldemort is just because of the prophecy, and Dumbledore really wants him to understand that not all prophecies come true and Harry is going to defeat Voldemort because he needs to defeat Voldemort and he wants to defeat Voldemort. It's not just because some person, Trelawney, told him that he's going and to. it's because Voldemort is making it true. Yes. Voldemort gave him the powers, and Dumbledore doesn't explicitly say this, but I just thought of it. Voldemort is telling, every time there's a battle, he tells everybody, don't kill Harry, I want to be the one to kill him. Mm -hmm. So that's just like entirely, nobody can kill Harry because... Voldemort has marked him as his own yes. and has told everybody, don't kill him, it's going to be me. Therefore, that battle's going to happen and either one or the other is going to die. Oh yeah, and that's why Voldemort doesn't want anyone else to kill him is because the prophecy says that right. one has to kill Voldemort the cares too much about the prophecy. Exactly. Basically, what Dumbledore is trying to do is make sure that Harry doesn't fall into what has happened to Voldemort because Voldemort has put all of his decision-making behind the prophecy and that is what is ultimately going to lead to his downfall. Whereas that shouldn't happen for Harry and it won't and Dumbledore wants to make sure that that won't happen. He brings up particular things like killing James gave Harry instinctual revenge and killing Lily gave him this love protection that Voldemort can't conquer. So it's basically Voldemort's fault that Harry can see into his thoughts. It's Voldemort's fault that Harry can speak parcel tongue. Dumbledore really wants to drive this home to Harry and he reminds him that Harry has never had any desire to learn the dark arts. And he has had no desire to join Voldemort or do any of the things that Voldemort has done. And Harry says, of course, because he killed my parents. And Dumbledore says, yes, exactly. in short, you are protected by your ability to love. He's protected from his own ego. Yes, he's from his own pride, his own hubris. His own, his own pride, all the things that are downfalls to Voldemort, he's mm -hmm. protected from because of love. And it actually, I feel like I'm Harry in this situation because it took, like, Dumbledore yelling it at me for me to be like, well, you can't like shoot spells with love. I'm like, yeah, I burned his face once, but he's figured out how to make, like, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But it's like, he, as a human, is not garbage because he's protected by this situation. And it comes back to the fact that Tom and Harry were very similar boys, very powerful, very unique sets of skills, mm -hmm. have like a bad home life, and both their parents are dead. Both of them are um, half bloods. Half bloods. They just take entirely different paths because he's protected by love. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I, I, yeah. All of this ultimately proves ah! that Mati is the best planeteer and the heart ring is the most powerful I, heart I, ring. I, what? We will do a big deep dive, fear not. So Dumbledore says, quote, Harry, have you any idea how few wizards could have seen what you saw in that mirror? Which is like pretty sweet to think. You got to put yourself in someone's mind. You have kids like Ron who just want to see, you know, I'm head boy and Quidditch captain and blah, 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 blah. And Harry just wanted to see his parents and be with him. And then, well, oh no, I thought he was calling back to... He says there are very few people who could see what you saw in the mirror, meaning all he wanted was to have the stone, but not for his own gain. Yes. That was the vision that he saw in the mirror that yes. very few people could I see. I think it could be both. I think it's just to see all that you want in your life is the love of your parents that you never got to meet. Because Harry could have thought of all this other stuff too. It could have been him with his parents and then all the other things, because you look at Ron's memory and it was a bunch of stuff. Harry's was very simple in Did that regard. Did we ever know what Hermione's was? No. She never saw it. It would probably would it be? be. She'd be uh, sitting in a library reading a bunch of books. She would just have a bunch of books. Smooching on Ron Weasley. Yeah. And then she'd have Crookshanks with her. And then she would have a higher grade in potions than <laughs> Harry. <laughs> 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 and her teeth would be regular. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's achieving most of those things. Yeah, she's so. doing a good job. So... <laughs> Dumbledore explains to Harry that he was unharmed by seeing into Voldemort's mind because of love. Voldemort can't possess him without feeling mortal pain because of love. And Voldemort doesn't understand that the power of a soul is so much greater when it is untarnished and it is whole. He said he was in such a hurry to mutilate his own soul, he never paused to understand the incomparable power of a soul that is untarnished and whole. Mm-hmm. 
<clears throat> it's very cute. Harry again tries to come back with the point that he has to try to kill Voldemort, and Dumbledore agrees. But he says it's not because the prophecy says so. It's because Harry cannot rest until he tries. We both know this. Dumbledore asks Harry to think about how he'd feel about Voldemort if he never heard the prophecy, and Harry then thinks of Cedric and Sirius as parents, and he has a great quote where he says, I'd want him finished, and I'd want to do it, which is amazing and it's something that I kind of wish it like ended the chapter because it's one of those like, I like yeah, it. CSI things. I like what ends the chapter. Oh though. no, what ends it is great. But it's one of those things that that would be such a great way if this is eventually turned into a, a TV series. That would be such a good one where it turns Bum-bum. zoom on Harry's face. Dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Executive producer Dick Wolf. Uh, so. so yeah, basically the prophecy means nothing. All it did was... Bring make, about the downfall of Voldemort. All, all it did was have Voldemort mark Harry as his equal. Mm-hmm. And Harry is free, but Voldemort is enslaved by it, which exactly. is what makes it real. And it all comes down to Voldemort basing his actions and decisions on a prophecy, which you shouldn't do, and Harry not necessarily basing his entire life around something that someone said that one time. After Harry says this awesome line, Dumbledore says, of course you would, and tells him that the prophecy doesn't mean he has to do anything, but the only thing it does mean is that Harry is equal to Voldemort in power. And with Voldemort continuing to hunt Harry, one is going to kill the other. It's inevitable, so Harry has to do it. And finally, after all of this explanation, and it even says that Dumbledore is pacing around the room and throwing his arms, like he's really trying to get through to this kid. After all of this, Harry realizes and finally understands that it's like the difference between being dragged into an arena for a fight and walking into an arena with confidence. Harry realizes that, quote, it makes all the difference in the world. And just, damn, what a chapter, just a roaring applause for J.K. Rowling. This whole book has been incredible, and this chapter is fantastic. So well done. Easily the best chapter that I have read, and I think it's going to be really hard to top. It was the difference between being dragged into the arena to face a battle to the death and walking into the arena with your head held high. Some people, perhaps, would say that there was little to choose between the two ways. But Dumbledore knew, and so do I, thought Harry, with a rush of fierce pride, and so did my parents, that there was all the difference in the world. And with that, oh! we end this chapter of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, and we end oh, this episode of Potterless. So, Kelly, how are you man. feeling about the best chapter? It was so good. This is why I claimed it. Yes, I very much understand why you called Dib so early because this yeah. is absolutely incredible. It just like this is everything. Every time that you're talking, and the next four or five chapters or whatever you have left in the book mm-hmm. that's not with me also yeah. holds true to this theory. Every time for the entirety of this book and the last five books, when you've been like, I don't understand what she's giving me all this detail. I don't care about all this detail. And I've been telling you, yes, 90% of this is just world building and just like flowering Yeah, I didn't really building. need to know what the hallways of St. Mungo's look like. Right. But 10 per- well, you don't know that yet. <laughs> but like 10% of it is her laying out this plan. Mm-hmm. She says that she wrote the finale when she was writing the first book. She mm-hmm. wrote how it was going to end. And this is what makes me believe it is because she's got this very intense timeline of mm-hmm. things that have been dropped into each book and yeah. I think that it's a little too easy the first one I think doesn't have as many of the hints no. but it's a little too easy for her to come back and be like oh yeah all this later on I do believe that she had this idea of yeah. how it all happened earlier on and that she's been dropping hints for us and also everything that's going to happen in the last five chapters of this book four chapters of this book that has been littered, has been, throughout, has been littered throughout this book yes. and oh no not just this book also the second book second book has a lot of it too it's ridiculous like it's ridiculous yeah. the things that you and the fifth book it, oh gosh it's just, just like yes, it's no, littered it's... with things throughout <laughs> and every time that you you've mentioned a couple of them and you're like this is garbage you don't need to know blah 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 and you'll read me a description of like some mundane thing and i'm like oh my gosh that comes back <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm glad that they're starting to come back and it's something that i didn't really appreciate until i actually listened to some more dungeons and dragons podcasts so the adventure zone and then join the party both do a very good job of this where you have a main overarching story mm-hmm. and there's little details along the way. And then as the story progresses, you have these callbacks that make sense. That's and called 
a series. Yeah, yes, but <laughs> it's something where I've listened to behind the scenes things for both of the podcasts and both Griffin and Eric Silver, who are the DMs for the main arcs. Griffin especially says that in the beginning he was just kind of doing it and not really knowing exactly where it was going to go. And then he kind of sat down and figured out the whole series and then made it all come together. I feel like that's how this And happened. that's what I feel like this is too. She wrote the first book, had some stuff in mind, and then before and then she, she started like, writing the second one, she was like, okay. It got bought and I she was it. like, okay, now I have a little more security. Let exactly. me keep going. Yes. Like the and first one can stand alone-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But it got bought and she got to write more. So. Yeah, that would be my guess is that it's very similar to the Adventure Zone. They made the first arc. It was good on its own. Yeah. They did, They realized it was going to be a success that they did for other stuff. She then you can really have these bigger her things, that little hint dropping that all come together in the end. And it is very impressive to see, mm. especially when she's pulling stuff out of the second book, which I am not shy about saying that I didn't like and I've been making fun of recently. It's still the worst one. Yeah, it's still the worst one, but it is nice to see her pick things out of every book. It really is showing that aside, I mean, the first one, of course, is important, but it shows that every other book in the series is very important, and what is really integral about this particular chapter is that it lays the groundwork of how the rest of the series is going to go. Clearly, yeah, yeah. we have been given a direction where, okay, now we know what's up. we got to find movies. the horror cruxes. Movies you We've got to, Okay, we don't need to discuss this. It's we're going to beat a dead so, horse. So the bad. movies are bad. But it, this chapter lays the foundation and the groundwork for the rest of the series where now the object is just find the horror cruxes, break the horror cruxes, kill Voldemort, series over. Did you mention anything about how you destroy a Horcrux? Um, he hasn't yet. He just has mentioned that it's very complicated and dangerous, I'm sure, what do you when think? they go into the cave. Um, I don't know. His hand was burnt, so I feel like something fire-related had to happen. Either that or the charm that was on the ring was like a fire defense system. Yeah, what about the other ones that you know about? I don't know. I think it's probably just a matter of like undoing all of whatever protective charms are on it and then doing some sort of powerful spell that destroys objects and breaks it down a la, uh, I won't say a spoiler for something, but something that kind of just, of a different series. Oh, okay. Um, not, what can no, you not spoil Potter, for me about Harry Potter? Potter. Potter. Um, but it's something where, it's some sort of spell that just like makes it go away. I don't know, kind of like how in Lord of the Rings you have to drop the the ring into the very particular fire that yes. can destroy it. It's well, some sort of spell. You know that, how like, the diary was, so was destroyed. Yeah, he just stabbed it. But it was Gryffindor's sword. So you should go back and read that chapter. That's I, not that's not what did it. Was it Fox? He he took a fang. The fang that was got stuck in his arm. Oh, he from took the, it and he just oh, stabbed he it. it with the with the snake. So do you have to use is it like only diamond can cut diamond or you have to use some like something for I don't know, a, a Slytherin snake item to kill the Slytherin diary? Well, remember Basilisk venom is highly poisonous and the only thing that can cure it is phoenix tears so you have to use some sort of really powerful so you have to use something really powerful but you've kind of broadened your view it's not just spells okay it could be powerful things okay that makes sense which if i were dumbledore at this point you're carrying around that sword with you i'd be telling harry how to how to do this because well i mean at some point harry's going to have to. well okay well i don't know and i'm not sure if you know but the chapter that i am set to read after we record all our episodes is them going to the cave for yeah. the first Horcrux. So yeah, I'm assuming I'm assuming he will explain in that chapter. I feel like he should have explained it here. Well, no, here it's late at night. It's very late. They've oh, done yeah. a bunch already. They've gone Probably through the like pensive at this point. And yeah, it's very it's the wee hours of the morning Harry's been through a lot he's also learned a lot also Dumbledore's probably stressed after trying to beat into this damn kid's head for an <laughs> hour that you don't listen to the fucking prophecy Harry uh, so he's it probably he's like I need a drink <laughs> like, I just need a, so he probably knows that he can just wait until they're actually about to destroy a horcrux to say this is how it works also in terms of a novel it makes nicer for I guess whatever it, and it gives yeah. him something to talk about on the ride over I'm surprised Harry cave. didn't ask well I think Harry's probably still just so surprised by everything that's going on that and uh, yeah Harry Potter the guy who never asked any questions ever I'm he not, asked a lot of really good questions in this yes but not in the rest of the series yes so I am not surprised in preparation for this I read the entire sixth book and I was going to stop where we stopped. Uh-huh. And I was like, I can't. i got to keep going. <laughs> and well. so I kept going. <laughs> well, that is the end of this episode. But we will be back with Kelly to discuss more of the next coming chapters. But Kelly, thank you so much for being on. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do on the website. It is beautiful. And I got to witness you firsthand doing all the editing of it every time a new episode goes up. And I'm glad that I don't do that shit. So <laughs> thank you so much. It's um, fun. Do you have anything to plug besides checking out the website? Check out the website. A lot of work goes into it. Yeah. And I don't know. I think it's cool. 
Yeah, and we're always adding new stuff to it. There's, yeah, there's pictures, any fan photo that's ever sent in goes on the website. Anyone that's ever been a patron is listed on the website. All the charities we donate to is on the website. There is the links to the merch store. Every episode, we're, Kelly and I are currently working on transcripts for all of the episodes. Um, we'll put those on the site. So, yeah, it's a good time. And I think it looks really pretty. <laughs> so uh, I like to I like the plug Michael Schubert check him out if you don't know I yeah, have you heard great. of this podcast uh, <laughs> yeah, it's this podcast, <laughs> I think it's wonderful if you like Potteros you'll love Potteros uh, so anyway guys thank you so much for listening Kelly thank you so much for being on and until next time as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter before they destroy horcruxes Wizard on! That must be the spell that destroys them. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> oh, I know! <laughs> <laughs> If you love Potterless and you want to show that love in the form of merchandise, you can do that because we have an entire merch store. If you go to bit.ly slash merch on all lowercase, you can get posters, pins, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all sorts of fun stuff. And if you're a patron, you get an exclusive discount. Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica, and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamick, Frank Chiodo, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsic, Kieran Webb, Luis Nisak, Akancha Saxena, Abita Men, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Benjamin Bridges, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanira, Kamel Doc, Anthony Bonarigo, Russell Dunk, Jenny Nilsson, Dustin Wolin Coot, Katie Rogers, Audra, Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Micah Cole, Andre Franz, Nikita Power, Colette Smith, Chrissy Hutton, Shrina Unat, Kat Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Sammy Kurti, Love Cash Longer, Shivani Patel, Ali Madsen, Cowmaid, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Kraus, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Heard, Courtney Allingham, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Francisco Bautista, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Gabrielle Medcroft, Jessica Ann, Natalie Dung, Arna Guthnadotter, Brandy Baldonado, Melody McInnes, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swaney, Zach Ross Klein, Elisa Figueroa, Daisy Kjartan Stodder, Jessica Jacob, Orca Grover, Jonathan Foy, Joe Harrison, Marcus Zeller, Isabel, Steve Trillower, Vivian Santos, Samuel Minor, Ellie Ravik, Victoria Renee, Kyla Schultz, Elena, Takari Arant, Darlene Ruiz, Brenna, Jackie Clear, Drake Perez, James Stepp, Haley Hastings, Marino, Kelsey Langstaff, Braden Morrison, Matthew Orienter, Taylor Fulton, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withred, Ash Prosser, Rosemary Heist, Peter Bemis, and Maria Vega. Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. If you want any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. You can find us on social media at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterlesspod, and instagram.com slash potterlesspodcast. Again, that bonus content is all at patreon.com slash potterless, and the merch is at bit.ly slash merch on. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on!